Uh, so we started discussing chapter five, right? Uh, I just wanted to point out something, okay? Before, before you know, you, I, I let you continue, uh, Federica. Um, okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, I believe we stop here in uh, section two, chapter five, and we were discussing uh, some uh, basic uh, forecasting methods. Okay, the naive method, the seasonal naive, and the drift method. And one of the things that we have to, you know, make sure that we understand, and and the authors, you know, kind of summarizes at the end, is that these are really simple methods of forecasting. Usually, you know, when you go to the final method, you're going to be using this as a baseline. Okay, so eventually what what you want to do is try to understand how the baseline you know forecast your data and then improve on that right so for example if you are doing a regression uh you know i'm not talking about time series by, by you know in, in 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 itself but if you're doing a regression usually i have seen that you can do like a naive method of you know just taking the mean of those uh points and then do a prediction, right? Within, you know, using the mean, like a naive method, using the mean. Then if you are building on that, for example, if you are doing a random forest, if you are doing a gradient boosting, if you are doing deep learning, what you want to do is always look at that baseline and then see if my method improves on that baseline, you know, by X, X amount or X percent. Because if not, for example, if you have a deep learning, you know, uh, algorithm and only improves slightly on that mean, that means that that method is not that great because deep learning is much, much more complex than just, you know, doing a mean, right? So sometimes uh, these methods, depending on the data, will give you a good forecast, even compared with other you know, more complex methods, okay? So it's good not to, you know, throw it away, just, you know, do them, they're very simple, just do them and then take in account that the next model that you're going to be looking, it has to improve on these models, on these baselines, because if not, then you're introducing more complexity and less accuracy, okay? So basically that's, you know, that's in a nutshell, you know, more or less, you know, what what these methods are are useful, you know, uh, for. Okay. So with that uh, little introduction, then you know, I'll let you go. <laughs> Did you get a new mouse? You got a new mouse. <laughs> I think you're in mute, uh, Federica. Uh, you, you are in mute. Yeah, I am. Okay. okay. All good, all good did, now. Did you get a new mouse? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, I didn't need it at the end. So oh, okay. was, uh, nothing, nothing wrong with my, uh, it, it was um, uh, the my power. Uh, that, oh, okay. Yeah, that was doing things. Uh, like the uh, with the, uh basically it was kind of fluctuating intermittent yeah it's not the original power uh charging thing oh so okay, okay i think that that did something wrong and it was something like connected so now i i know i realized that when when <laughs> if i'm in particular uh, place and i i plug that in uh it does again okay okay so, so it creates some interference you know somewhere yeah that's <laughs> my my pointer uh and i cannot move it anymore if i okay. unplug it, uh the, the 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 pointer is cleared up okay there you go okay yeah um i mean i usually you know because i i most of the time i would use a laptop i usually use the you know the pad that comes yeah, with yeah. the laptop. Usually I don't I use the mouse unless I am in the desktop, right? 
but you know that's something that may, maybe or maybe not you know would would help yeah you. i had to use the mouse i had to uh, find the mouse and uh, and plug in the mouse and do okay. the mouse. playing with it to find right. the read i clicked uh, to uh, disable my trackpad so i couldn't use it anymore so i had mm -hmm. to use the mouse to clean that up Okay, so as you just mentioned, let's go back uh, on track. Uh, as you just mentioned, uh, this method, as mentioned in the chapter, are best served as benchmarks. So they will, as, as we can see um, in this first, in the plot that you have just shown, we have some uh, baseline, okay? So we do not expect that our uh, time series in the future will go up over this red reddish line, neither down, put it down this, this gray, uh, green, green line. But, so this is not, uh, this is not enough. Okay, so we uh, would like to go a bit Mm, to have something a bit more uh, precise. So we like to um, release a forecast that uh, is able to tell us uh, uh, more or less uh, uh, a value that can be reasonable um, uh, what is the outcome in the future. Okay, so for doing this, uh, Let's first uh, uh, have a look at uh, this benchmark, okay? So we use in this example, the Google data, okay? And um, this is the first uh, uh, example. So we use this Google doc, uh, stock uh, made from this um, uh, uh, um, let's say GAFA stock data, okay? So we have uh, uh, the time series, the uh, value of open, the value, uh, the highest value, the lowest value, the value of close. So these are uh, basically what are we interested in? And this is what we uh, like to uh, be predicting basically. So we like to, to uh, be able to 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 forecast uh, the value at open, what will be at close, so we can earn some money from somehow saying that uh, we can buy some of these shares, for example, be, for example, because we expect them to um, to grow within time, or we might decide to sell those those shares uh, if we expect them to to go lower certain bar but the, the benchmarks are are a good point to start okay so we then we have uh, uh, also the volume so the numbers of of shares on at these values within times and so on but so here is a, a just a little bit of tidying this data so in a way that we now have uh, um, looking different values because um, we have updated the, the, the table by index uh, and by day. Uh, and then we uh, also have filtered uh, just Google uh, data. Uh, the, this is the reason because it's different. So that was... Uh, Another uh, another stock. So we we select Google and uh, we filter the the year uh, to be greater than uh, 2015, and then so uh, we set um, a day uh, backwards. This is our new uh, Google stock. Uh, data and then next step is to like focus on on uh, 2015 and then use this to model uh, here is the um, we we use this uh, three uh, options so 
זה מין, בי נאיב, אין בי נאיב, אוקיי? Inside the model function. And this is our state. The, the, we, can, we can see that uh, uh, there is um, this type of uh, output, uh, and then um, you uh, use this output to, to see inside what, what uh, um, What are the results of the seed, basically? Okay, so this is our Google seed. Then we like to produce a forecast for this for trading, and uh, uh, let's say January 16. Okay, so we, we from the Google stock we filter uh, the year month 16 for the year uh, 2016. And then uh, we use the, the feet of the model. And we do the, we use this uh, because so we know already the feature. We know already the outcome. So what happened in 2016. And we want, we like to test our model and see if we get closer. Okay. So this is the result and then we, we do uh, a plot okay okay and so what this type of model uh, which is a mean model so which use the mean value and the naive and the, the naive drift so these three values are uh, the benchmark values. So as we can see, what's happened in 2016, it's within the naive and the mean value. The, let, let's say that the drift is still a bit far. Okay, so it's, in, it's within these two. We can do better, okay? So, for example, if um, we uh, use this um, function auto layer, Yeah, uh, so we we are able to to find um, basically this uh, um, what is happening what what we already know about in two thousand sixteen. Okay, so so seeing that the naive is the closer. Uh, it's the, the closest one to um, what uh, uh, was happening. Uh, what effectively happened in 2016? Uh, okay, so we can fit uh, this uh, um, Google uh, 2015 which is uh, uh, above it, our data, okay, uh, to the model function just using the naive, okay? And then we, if we simulate uh, this, uh, um, um, a certain number of times uh, with a bootstrap, so we basically replicate uh, the value of the, the, the fit of the model. We generate a replication of this thing. What happens here is then the, the result of a simulation, as you can see, is a table uh, of uh, 150 observations. And it's a mean value 
this is the value of the, the simulation. If I use this to, um, to plot it, what are the results here? Well, a series of possible outcomes. Okay, if I just go back to our previous, um, so this is what has happened. Okay, this is the, the result of the simulation. Somehow, somehow we are able to catch uh, what effectively happened. But we, if we don't know, how do we choose between these different outcomes? This might be a thing. At the same time, this is the, this this way the the way of using simulations. Uh, it's a better way to uh, even if uh, as a mm, benchmarking a bit more specific. Um, it's a way that uh, lets you focalize better on the type of trend that can happen if. Uh, things go on on a certain um, uh, certain certain way, basically. Okay. So basically, if it goes down, if we expect that it will go down, so we expect it to replicate. It doesn't go down immediately, but it replicates a bit and then uh, drops down. Instead, if we expect it to, to go uh, stable somehow, so it will drop a bit and then stabilizing. So it, it basically uh, able to simulate all possible outcomes within the specified batch. And this is quite, quite uh, visually interesting and uh, uh, Opens up uh, possibilities. Okay. Um, now, if we go back where we were, okay, uh, and say that uh, on our on our Google Data 2015, we go back to our three uh, ways, like three. Three type of models, you know, the mean, the naive, and the naive drift. Let's do this again. Okay. We can uh, have a look at the accuracy of these type of benchmarks, and we can see that. Uh, um, we have some, some information about the RMSE, about the mean absolute error and everything that um, for each model can help us identify which one is the one to use inside for making a simulation. Okay, would be best. Okay. Um, here we in the simulation we use the naive. The result for for the naive, okay, is this one here. As you can see, as we know, the value is the lowest for the RMSE and for the my the abs, mean absolute error. So this might help you understanding which one of the three would be best best to use for making a simulation, generating a simulation, and then uh, obtain something like this that more, it's, it's visually helpful. Uh, okay. Federica, if you can move your window, the plow window to the right, uh -huh. uh, move it to the, no, to, to your right. My right? The other way, yeah. the other way, uh-huh. And run again that accuracy. Because the, it has two more uh, metrics yeah. that were not missing because it was cut off, you know, because of the window uh, width. 
Ajá, there, yeah. yeah. Okay, now, 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 now you have all the metrics now. <laughs> These are uh, also, we have the, the correlation. Uh, this is not very helpful somehow because the, those two, the mean and the naive are, are to, 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 like the same. But uh, uh, so basically uh, just having a look at the RMSE and the ma uh, mean absolute error is um, helpful to deciding which of these three models um, will be best to use for, for a simulation, okay? Okay, what, one thing that we, we must be very, uh, uh, you know, uh, have it in the back of, of our minds is that some of those metrics uh, can be influenced by the outliers on the data. For example, the R R RMSE, is influenced by the outliers because it measures the distance between the mean and then squares it and then uh, you know uh, power to the two and then uh, squares it. So uh, we have to be careful with that one. Also, the R RMSC is susceptible to the transformations that we use in the data. For example, if you use a log transformation, probably that RMSC is going to be much lower, okay? Than if you compare to the actual value. So you have to be aware that some of these metrics can be uh, can be altered because of outliers and because also of uh, uh, transformations. Uh, there's, there's one, I, I don't see it there, but there's one that I have seen that is the median, median absolute deviation, MAD. And that one, because it uses the median, it doesn't, it doesn't use the mean, it, it is more robust when the outliers are present, okay? But still the math, if you do transformations, is going to, you know, it's going to change that 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 metric like the RMS, RMSE. But, you know, we, we should be careful. Also, there's another one called RMSLE, which uses the log, okay? The RMSE uses the log of that value, which, you know, states stays more stable than the actual also RMSE. I've seen it in, in Kaggle competitions a lot. Uh, RMS LE. Okay. Room mean square log error. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So let's uh, uh, do a new share. Uh, this time I might need to. Can you, can you see? Yeah. Okay. So um, this chapter is uh, um, a chapter that um, helps you uh, understand what are the uh, the tools uh, for your disposition, okay? So we have talked about uh, the mean uh, and which is something that is um, very useful to use in the model because it gives you an idea of what can happen on average. And it sometimes can be that uh, the, 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 the value that you are searching. Uh, and you can manipulate the mean, standardizing values, like subtracting the mean from, from the values, and so reducing the standard deviation, um, the variation of the data, and having a look at the, um, at the residuals, okay? Uh, more... Uh, more to say is about transformation, as you just mentioned, okay? Uh, we can deal with um, uh, our data uh, using transformation, 
in a way that uh, uh, we can adjust um, uh, uh, our data with applying, for example, a box clock transformation. Uh, and this uh, um, is uh, able to um, let, um, basically uh, identify the trend um, through a back transformation. So, um, there is a, a, a series of um, mathematical notations here uh, that we uh, apply uh, with, with some uh, uh, functions. Uh, we can, uh, for example, um, inside the model function, uh, use the log. And then produce the forecast. And then this is our, an, a, a different data. But just to, to give an idea of what are the potentialities, so what you can do, um, uh, for example, here uh, you have, uh, again, uh, a range of possibilities. Uh, and it shows you the mean and the median values. So uh, you, again, you might not be satisfied with this uh, um, uh, range of possibilities because you want like to be uh, uh, more precise and to understand what are your risks. Uh, when you expect some values and then the outcome uh, is different. So, uh, but at the same time, you have this uh, mean and the median and this range of values that can um, let you focalize on what are uh, the, um, I find the range of possibilities. Okay, to do, in order to do this, uh, you, you, you again um, um, can choose different uh, options inside the functions and then uh, um, obviously uh, adjust for what is uh, not the expected result. Okay, so you this this is a a uh, um, way to uh, to to have a, a picture of of what could happen, but then you need to dig uh, dig inside it and make manipulations. Uh, jo jo just a comment, Federica. Uh, it's interesting that. To trust you, of course. Can you hear me? Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting yes. that you are uh, showing the annual egg, egg prices. And we know that precisely this year there was a spike, right? In, uh, in, in the price of the eggs because of an event that apparently was not considered in this forecast, which is the, the avian flu, okay? So sometimes you have to make sure that your forecast has certain assumptions, right? That, you know, there's an assumption that what we have seen before is going to be repeated in the, in, in the future. If there's an event that affects, you know, the... The population of chickens or something, then this forecast will have to be reevaluated. Okay. And that will be a big disclaimer because, you know, it's, it's always predicting the future is always a, it's always a pickle. Uh, you know, you don't know exactly what, what, what events are going to be affecting that particular forecast. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And let me tell you, you know, it was about, if I was taking this course about three years ago, I say, yeah, that sounds reasonable. The egg prices will still go down, you know, and all that. But things happen. <laughs> yeah. So I will, yeah, exactly. 
So a way to uh, dig inside is to maybe do some decomposition uh, of your time space. Uh, we, we talked about this decomposition on chapter three. Uh, and again, it, this is within the tools uh, at your disposition. And uh, we already uh, have seen this uh, uh, specific models uh, that lets you uh, identify the trend uh, that is like repeating itself uh, Within, within, within your uh, available time uh, uh, data. Um, so you can use this SPL model. For example, here we are talking about the uh, US employment uh, and um, we filter by uh, our uh, time series to be greater than the 1990. Uh, and then we use this SPL model uh, on the to 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 forecast the employed number of people employed and um, and the trend. So with this uh, time series decomposition, we can identify the components, okay? And then we then can um, plot them, forecast them, and so on. So here we see that uh, uh, there is a level uh, which is identified, 95 and 80, which is this, um, the best, uh, so the, those things that are, the most uh, uh, the, the most the, uh, identified thing. okay so and this is a, a way to do the decomposition otherwise you can um, do other things uh, like adjusting with a, a naive seasonal, seasonal adjustment and this is a different uh, um, decomposition series. Uh, as you can see, it does replicate exactly what's happening, what's happened before, and it is projected in the future. Okay, so the trend here uh, shows you that there is um, like a repetition on the, on the uh certain period and so you expect that to be uh, that way even in the future and so you can use this uh, to identify and you can see that this is the main trend and then when you dig inside and you want to see uh within the month uh, if there's any repetition uh, you, you might want to use this seasonal adjustment. Seasonal adjustment. But then again, uh, we talked about the residuals, and the residuals are an important part, okay? So if you can uh, manage the residuals, so the residuals, wh when we talk about modeling, okay? And the first things that you look at are the residuals. Because the residuals are the variation that you uh, are not expected to uh, to manage somehow. Um, so uh, if if the residuals have a um, Gaussian distribution, so are normally distributed, so then you are you are okay. Let, let's say this uh, in in simple terms that your model, uh, so your your data are manageable and predictable easily somehow if it's a predict prediction is easy but when uh, the residuals are not uh, uh, that understandable so they they have spicy uh, elements or uh, outliers they're not gaussians in, in any manner uh, they do not show uh, a trend um, uh, at that point, you need to uh, adjust your data again uh, in a way uh, as well as um, your residuals in, in, 
because you need to treat your residuals at that point. Uh, if your residuals, um, uh, there is uh, a not uh, uh, like uh, a rich or in white noise, and these are those values that are um, I have. Uh, um, you need to adjust. So you know if you have something to add to this. Uh, um, uh, Federica, you know, one of the things that is happening, and if you can just go up a little bit, no, no, uh, in the in the decomposition. Yeah, just in that last part, forecasting with the composite. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, go 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 down, where where the residuals are. Okay. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Uh huh. Right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. Okay. So, in this plot, the gg underscore ts residuals, you have three uh, graphs. Okay. Uh, one is the innovation residuals, which they should be behaving like a random, you know, pattern. Okay. In other words, you know, they, they shouldn't be clumped in certain areas. And probably this graph is not that bad. Okay. In terms of the, the distribution of those uh, re residuals, which is the actual versus the, the predicted value. Then in the plot, to the to the right, okay, we have an histogram. And what it's saying is that if your residuals have a distribution, like a Gaussian distribution, or as said before, as a normal distribution, then your assumptions are valid. The one that is 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 a problem here is the that ACF, the autocorrelation uh, plot, because in that comment up up up. Okay, there's a comment from the author, you know, before the, uh -huh. there's a comment that says that the ACF of the residuals displays significant autocorrelations. So in, a, in an ideal situation, you should have those, you know, lines within the, the blue lines. Okay, so in other words, those lines are not significant. Those are the significant, you know, bars. So here, what is happening is that the method that we're using to forecast is now capturing some of the correlations that are present in the data. Okay, that's what the author says. These are due to the naive method not capturing the changing trend in the seasonally adjusted series. So here, probably we'll have to see if there's another method of forecasting that can capture that. And probably there is. Okay, we have exponential smoothing. We have ARIMA methods that are, uh, you know, uh, base that are engineered to capture the trend and the seasonality much better. Okay, but here the problem is the method that the method is not capturing those lags. Okay, it's still there's still some information that the that the forecasting method is not you know is not capturing. And this is something that is very good for diagnostic because you have to test by the residuals and also by the autocorrelation, you have to test if your, if your method is capturing as much as possible the information that your data is, you know, is, 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 is showing you, okay? Yeah, okay. Um, so then, um... We can evaluate those things uh, basically um, again. Um, you, this is a, uh, a bit like uh, what you mentioned about other um, uh, metrics to use. So we have uh, uh, other values. This is uh, um, the mention of the other metrics and 
uh, an example of the um, uh, what I, uh, uh, I wanted to uh, show you is that when I uh, if I use let, let's okay now this is the beer okay uh, data set but um, let, let's say that uh, we are uh, even if we google as, as before okay here with the accuracy you can have uh, this list in, the, in this case for example there is one more method uh, so we uh, have used the mean method before the naive method and the drift method here there is the seasonal naive method in addition and as you can see the values are quite different you, you can see that this is uh, quite lower than um, all the others so you might think the seasonal life method is the one that I'm going to use. Okay. <clears throat> this is what we seen before. And so you th there is a, a, a bit of information, a bit of a repetition of the things that we did it before. Uh, I didn't uh, spend much time on uh, on this math uh, because uh, I don't know if if we we might want to to have uh, um, if we like to go through them we can uh, we can go through them next time or some other. Uh, in, in, in the, yeah, the, the, uh, I, I, I think that the, the, the most important point here also is that you have different metrics, right? To measure how well your forecasting method is adjusting to the data, okay? So you have RMSEs, you have MAPE, you have all that, fine. But one of the things that also you have to do in order to have, have a, a visual sense of what's happening is also to plot it, okay? So even though you can have a method that is telling you, okay, from the metrics, this is the method that you know that apparently is 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 a is, is a good fit for the data. You have to also visualize it, okay? Because when you visualize it, then you can see if the forecast of that method is following the data, and sometimes it doesn't, okay? Sometimes, you know, it does crazy, crazy things. So you have to check the metric and also check the plot, the visual, to see if they make sense to you, okay? In this case, the, I think there's a plot for the beer before the metrics, okay? Okay, and as you can see in that plot, you can see the four methods, okay? You have the drift, you have the mean, you have the naive, and also you have the seasonal naive. And as you can see, the seasonal naive does very well doing the seasonality, right? Of that period that we are testing. Of course, that, this, this, is, this, is a, this is a very simple example. Uh, you have to do certain techniques on cross-validation to see if that pattern can be captured by the, you know, by the, by the, by, 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 by the, by, by the method. Okay, right now we'll see that at least the last part that we're using for testing, right, for doing the forecast, uh, it has a nice fit, right? But we have yeah. to see if that fit repeats all over uh, the, the data. So you can do in, you know, in, in more uh, advanced uh, techniques, you can do an in-training, in-sample uh, forecast, and then an out-sample. What, we, what we're seeing there is an out-sample. Okay, is the one that we are reserving the testing that we're reserving for the forecast. But the other data that we have, that's the in sample. And you have and you want to see if the model also can, you know, fit well in that sense. So there's a lot of things that you have to make, a lot of like experiments that you have to make in this time series to get a good feeling of okay, this is the method really that 
right now as a as a best fit for this kind of pattern. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So we have seen the Google thing, and now um, uh, one more interesting thing that we can uh, like uh, select. Uh, as you can see here, the uh, this range of prediction um, actually capture the value at its bottom side, and this is quite visually interesting. Okay, but you might have uh, expected this uh, somehow. Uh, this average value so that this gets its bottom of the uh, of the range it's it's nice nicely shown but it's not very uh, satisfying somehow okay so if, uh, in terms of using for for a prediction, okay. You, so, usually, usually, Federica, those uh, interval uh, 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 confidence intervals, uh, the more variable your data is, the larger they're going to be, okay? Because what they're trying to do is accommodate basically all the possibilities that you have from your past data, mm -hmm. okay? So if your data is very variable, that's why it's important that you maintain a uniform variance, okay? And that's why you do the log usually, okay? To try to uniform that variance because that's one of the things that certain models uh, assume that your data is, has a constant mean, a constant variance, et cetera. That's called stationarity. So the more, you know, the, sorry, the more, variable you have okay the more you know uh, erratic uh, uh, spikes you have in your data those uh, confidence intervals are going to be a little bit bigger okay because they want to accommodate that uncertainty that's what they're trying to do okay from the expected value that you said that is that you know line which is the mean in the in this case Okay, then um, just to you know uh, close up a bit, um, there, there's more interesting things like you can uh, dig into quantiles uh, and to do in order to do this, you specify uh, a specific uh, day, uh, date, uh, and then you uh, there is an option here. Uh, inside the accuracy, uh, you can list the quantiles, uh, selecting the quantile score and the probability. For example, here we have this value, okay, by the test, um, it's 4.86. This, this value doesn't, doesn't say much, okay. Uh, it's it, it's not very helpful somehow, but if we go forward with this uh, uh, put uh, uh, like uh, options uh, course that you can use, uh, we have this uh, Winkler score, which is proposed by Winkler. Um, and again, it's a sort of uh, composition of quantiles that you can, uh, uh, with an adjustment that you can use. And here again, you specify the day, uh, the day, and um, you inside the accuracy list at this time with the, the Winkler score uh, with a certain uh, level that we used before. And now we have this value 55.7. So, um, as you can see, uh, it's, a, um, it's an adjustment of uh, um, more than uh, a quantile, okay? And, but then the, the chapter says that all these, these things uh, can, can be uh, are useful, but 
can be trusted with. Okay. So because they they contain information which are uh, they may not repeating themselves in the future. Okay, so uh, then there is uh, another uh, type of uh, uh, score, which is the ranked probability, continuous ranked probability. Uh, and it is this one here, inside the accuracy, you specify the continuous rank pro uh, probability. And you, uh, okay, here uh, there are all three methods, uh, models used, the drift, the mean, and the naive. As you can see, the values for the naive and the drift, which is the naive drift, uh, are quite similar somehow because the mean is fairly different. Okay, the naive method is giving better distributional forecast than the drift or the mean method. But, you know, they are almost quite similar. This is double then. Okay, so yes, this is the, 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 the lowest value, but those two are very close to each other. Yeah? And then there is another score, which is scale free comparison. This is skill scores. And again, this is a composition of the, mm -hmm. um, the continuous ranked probability score. And composition, or better said, an adjustment. So it's a modification. It's like, uh, um, uh, Ferry, uh, I had to. Yeah. Uh, I, I had to stop you there because you know I have to leave. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Time. Time up. Yeah. So, uh, for the exercises, if you can go to five point eleven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just go there. And... Okay. Let's do the first one. Okay. Okay. Uh, you don't have to do every one of them. Just choose one or two. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just do one or two of the data sets and apply the naive, seasonal naive, the drift model, etc. Do the accuracies. Maybe you can do some scoring and all that. And then, you know, we can compare results. Okay. For the next one. Yeah. Okay. okay? Excellent. Have Thank a you. Have a, have a great weekend, okay? <laughs> Bye. Pray, 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 pray for peace. <laughs> yeah. Peace in the world, yeah. <laughs> it's, okay. it's not it's not cliche anymore. <laughs> okay, take care. Bye.